Spring Security can be seen as a massive rabbit hole. If you go onto YouTube and search up Spring Security tutorials, you're probably going to run into hundreds, if not thousands, of different tutorials. Except many of the Spring Security tutorials are either going to be out of date or barely hit the surface of what you're actually going to need inside of your Spring Security application. This means that you're going to have to go on and search for even more and more and more tutorials that are either going to be out of date or way too complex. And congratulations, you've now entered tutorial hell. This is exactly where I found myself when I started researching to start building the Let's Build Twitter series on YouTube. I need a backend service with password encryption, and I knew that Spring Security is probably the easiest, most straightforward way to do this, namely with the Bcrypt encryption library. So then I went from tutorial to tutorial, running into old tutorials, tutorials that are way too complicated, and tutorials that were using deprecated features of the framework that I should not be using anymore. And then whenever I finally did find a tutorial that was not out of date, it was only showing me very basic user authentication and things that weren't going to be that useful for me inside my own application. And eventually, after watching hours and hours of Amigos Code and Dan Vega, I was finally able to take all those different tutorials and I could finally piece all those things together to get to the point where I could actually make my backend application be what I actually need for my service. And all of that is my goal of today's video. I want to create this video to save you guys all the hassle and time that's going to take to go through and watch all the different tutorials that I had to watch to get to the point where I'm at now and put it into one single video for you to watch right now. What I'm going to do throughout this video is I'm going to go ahead and make a backend application for you that's going to be meant to be paired with a frontend application that's going to have built-in password encryption, it's going to have access to databases, it's going to allow you to make HTTP requests to log in a user and register a user, and it's also going to go ahead and generate JWT tokens for you to go ahead and authorize against whenever you make requests to user specific routes. I want you all to know that this is only meant to be a crash course to get a very simple API up and running. And then from there, you can go ahead and add whatever features that you might need for your own application. This code is gonna be available in a GitHub repository in the description below, but I would really recommend going ahead and watching this entire video. That way you can get some tips and tricks and context as well about what we're actually coding inside the project. We aren't going to be going super deep into the inner workings of Spring Security in this video. This is just, like I said, a crash course on how to get everything set up. So if you do want to go ahead and go deeper, I would definitely suggest checking out Amigos Code or Dan Vega. They're both really good resources on Spring Security. I'd highly recommend watching them if you do want the basics, but obviously come back to this video that we can get an all-in-one with JWTs, database access, and logging in with HTTP requests. As always, I'm Ethan, or Unknown Coder. As my day job, I actually train software engineers. And I do want to make a small disclaimer. All the content that you're going to see in this video is all mine. I would never take or use any of the intellectual property from my own job. I don't even train Spring Security in my own job. This is all a passion project and a side project I'm working on on my own. So with that being said, let's go ahead and hop onto my computer behind me. And let's start taking a look at what we're going to need and how we're going to start this project out. Of course, this project's going to have a few prerequisite pieces of technology and other things like that, that you're going to need to know beforehand. First off, of course, we're going to need a code editor or something like an IDE. For this project, I actually trialed out VS Code. In the next slide, I'll go ahead and give you the extensions that I used. Of course, you could always use Eclipse Enterprise Edition, Spring Tool Suite, or IntelliJ. I would suggest either Eclipse Enterprise Edition or IntelliJ. The only downside of IntelliJ is that you have to pay for the premium and pay for Ultimate to get the Spring Initializer. However, with VS Code and with Eclipse Enterprise Edition, you can go ahead and download the Spring Initializer for free. If you do go ahead and want to follow along with me and use the VS Code, all we need are the extension packs for Java and the Spring Boot extension pack. This is going to get you everything that you need for developing Java applications, as well as everything you need to develop Spring Boot applications. Make sure you get the Java Developer Pack from Microsoft and that you get the Spring Boot extension pack from VMware. That way you know that you have the right packs. Next of course we need our languages so we are going to be using java 17 for spring boot version 3.0 plus and then you'll also want whatever your flavor of sql is for example i typically use postgresql but there's plenty of other languages as well finally you're going to want some underlying understanding of spring boot and probably spring data for this project this is not an introductory level tutorial so i'm going to go ahead and assume that you've used spring boot before and you might have even used a little bit of spring data as well so with that being said let's go ahead and hop in and i'll show you guys what we're building for this project. This is the application we're going to be building throughout this tutorial. Let's go ahead and start at the very front. 
all of our requests are going to come through this thing called a security filter chain. And this is where we're going to decide whether or not and how we are going to go ahead and authorize or authenticate things. Some of the requests are going to be sent straight from the security filter chain into our authentication controller. And these are going to be requests like login and register. So we don't need to be authenticated to go ahead and do those. And then the requests that we do need to be authenticated are going to go through this OAuth resource server because these are going to be because these are going to have JWTs attached to them. These are going to be things that are locked behind roles, such as user and admin. For the time being, we don't really do, we don't really expand upon the user control and the admin controller because we're just trying to show you all how to set up your authentication and everything. So going back up to our authentication side, whenever we make a request to the authentication controller, we're going to talk to one of many services. The, one of the requests might be to log in. So to log in, we'll need to go ahead and talk to the user service, which will need to talk to the authentication manager and then pass back an authentication token to our token service to send back to the user. Or if we are going to go ahead and register, we're going to have to send a request to the authentication service, which talks to the user and so on and so forth. We're going to have two databases, one for user and one for roles, which will be communicating between the user service and the authentication service. And then the token service is only going to be used to create and generate JWT tokens. So with that being said, let's go ahead and generate our project and hop into our development. So we're going to start out at start.spring.io where we can find the spring initializer. The spring initializer is a tool provided by the spring team to easily generate spring boot starter projects for us, as we can see. And the reason that I'm opting to use spring initializer here is because I want to keep the project set up as universal as possible. You can easily set up a project here and import it into any ID that you want, including VS code, IntelliJ community, or ultimate edition, Eclipse spring tool suite, or any other code editor that you may use. If you are familiar on how to create a spring starter project inside of your code editor by all means go ahead and do that i'm just trying to keep this as simple as possible so now getting into the project setup the first thing we want to do is choose our project type you can choose whichever build tool that you're familiar with i prefer using maven so that's what i'm going to go ahead and choose again if you prefer using gradle with either groovy or kotlin feel free to select one of these let's go ahead and select maven next we are going to be using java as our language again if you guys are using something else feel free this is a java based tutorial though and next is probably the most important one and this is for the spring boot version so the spring boot version is going to be a very important decision if you decide to use version 3.0 plus you will have to use java version 17 plus i train software engineers on enterprise level development and majority of enterprise software is still using java 8 with the very smallest percentage of those enterprises switching over to java 11. so personally i like using versions 2.0 plus of spring boot that way i can use java 11. the largest difference you'll run into between spring Spring Boot 3 Plus and Spring Boot 2 Plus is that whenever you're working with data persistence, in Java 17, you're forced to use the new Jakarta packages instead of the old Java X packages. But with that being said, we will go ahead and choose version 3.0.4 for this tutorial. That way it's as up to date as possible. Next, we want to fill out the project metadata information, starting out with the group ID. You can set this to whatever you like. Typically, this is going to be reverse domain of whatever company you're working at. I don't have a domain or a company, so I'm just going to put it as unknown coder. Next, we need the artifact ID. So this is going to be basically what your project is called. If you are building a service that would be going on to the Maven repository, you'd want to make sure that you're using lowercase for this. I'm just building a standalone service that's not going to go on the Maven repository or anything. So I'm just going to use uppercases here. And I'm just going to call my project name authenticated backend. Again, if you're going to be putting this on the Maven repository, you'd probably want to go ahead and name this lowercase with dashes in between. For the description, you can put whatever you like. For us, I'm just going to be putting in Spring Boot, Spring Security, Authenticated Backend because that's exactly what we're building. And finally, for the package name, if you want to keep it as Authenticated Backend, you can. Although I'm just going to shorten mine to com.unknowncoder. Again, this is going to be something important whenever we get into building things that like services that are going to go onto the main repository. But again, this is going to be a standalone project that we're just running. I'm not worried about it. Finally, we are going to keep the packaging as jar. And as we talked about earlier, if we're using version 3.0 plus, we are going to have to keep Java version 17 plus. If you do want to be at the latest and greatest, you can do 19. However, 17 is the most recent long-term support so we are going to go ahead and keep that now that we have our metadata all filled out we can start talking about our dependencies we're going to start out by building a very basic backend service and then we're going to start securing it with spring security and jwts so we'll start out by adding spring web this is going to allow us to create our service routes which will eventually be called by a front-end client 
Next, we want to add Spring Data JPA. This will allow us to easily access just about any relational database that we want. This is where you'll see the biggest change between Java 11 and Java 17. Instead of using the interface from Java X Persistence Package, you'll be now using the interfaces from the Jakarta Persistence API, which should act very similarly, if not the same. Now we will add the driver for H2 database. I want a database to query for user credentials to show you all how to actually do that. However, I want to keep this focused on Spring Security and not setting up a database. You can basically sub out any relational database you would like in this situation. I will be setting up the H2 file database to act just like a Postgres database, just so you all know. If you are interested in using some other relational database or relational database not supported by JPA for some reason, you can always look into some of those other Spring data frameworks as well. Finally, we'll add Spring Boot DevTools, which will disable caching during development and also live reload a server anytime we save our backend code. Now that we've got everything filled out, we can go ahead and hit this generate button at the bottom of the screen. This will go ahead and download a zip folder with the generate Spring Boot project. Now that this zip folder is downloaded, I'm going to go ahead and move this over to my desktop just for ease of use. And I'll meet you guys over there with the next steps. As you can see, we have the zip folder on our desktop. Now all we need to do is go ahead and simply right click it and do open. This should open up a window similar to this where you can see another folder inside, which is the actual project itself. Again, you guys can store this wherever you want, but all I'm going to do is go ahead and drag and drop onto my desktop. You guys can drag and drop into any folder that you like, wherever you put your projects, that's all good. And now we can go ahead and close out of this folder and delete the zip. And finally, what we need to do next is open up this project in VS Code. As we talked about, I'm just using VS Code because it's very accessible. So all I gotta do is go ahead and right click on this and then open with code. Whenever it gets opened, it should be loading some stuff up and you should see Java projects on the top where you can see the authenticated backend. The only issue with the Java projects tab is that you can't see the palm, which we'll probably need access to later on. So keep that in mind. However, you can use this to create packages and classes. And then also on the left side, you should see a Spring Boot dashboard. You might see a couple other tabs such as beans and endpoint mappings. We're not going to deal with the beans or the endpoint mappings, but we will be using this to start and stop our server anytime we want to continue working. So with that being said, let's go ahead and hop into some coding. As mentioned before, we're going to start out by building out an application that is just a normal old REST API or an API in general. It might not be conforming exactly to REST. Then we're gonna go back through and we're going to secure that. Since we added Spring Data, we actually have to go ahead and set up the database connection information first. Otherwise, if we do try to run the Spring application, it's not going to run and it's not gonna work. So to do that, we wanna go over to source main resources and then go into our application.properties. The first thing that we're gonna go ahead and set is the server port. I like to change this off of port 8080 just because everything runs on 8080. There's like going to be a clash or there could be a clash so i like to set this to just something like port 8000 so that's what i'll go ahead and do so that's just going to make us so that our application runs on a different port now we need to go ahead and set up our database information the first thing that we need to set is the spring.datasource.url and we are going to use the url to a file on our system so let's go ahead and set that up So this is going to be the URL to our database. Like I mentioned before, we are going to store this inside of a file. And then you can also see mode equal to PostgreSQL. This is just basically going to give us Postgres type syntax whenever we're working with the database. Next, we need to set up the Spring Data Source driver class, and that is going to literally give us the driver for our database connection. So this is going to be org.h2.driver because this is obviously the driver or the database that we're using. Next, we can set up a username for our database with spring.datasource.username. Normally, whenever you're using a H2 database, we just default to SA. Then we need to set up the spring.datasource.password. This is going to be the default password for our Postgres database. You don't technically need a password. You could leave this off, but typically you're going to have a password whenever you're working with like an RDS or something along those lines. So I'd like to go ahead and add that as well. We're going with a super secure password of just password in this instance. Obviously, you could probably either want to use an environment variable for these or just have a properties file that's stored on your production server somewhere and not push these files up to github but obviously you do not want to leak your database credentials now we need to set up the spring.jpa.database platform this is going to get our dialect so it knows how to convert the jpa queries over to the platform dependent queries this is what makes jpa so powerful and since we're using h2 we're going to grab that from org.hibernate.h2 dialect 
Again, you're gonna use whatever dialect's gonna be needed for the specific database vendor that you're actually using. So it might be Postgres or MySQL Oracle, whatever it is, you need to swap that out. Next, we need the spring.jpa.showsql. All of this does is prints out the SQL in text form inside the console in like a log. All this does is actually slows down our application. So we do want to get rid of this. So we're going to set this one to false. And the next one is going to be very important. It's going to determine how our database is set up and tore down if it is or not. And this is spring.jpa.hibernate.ddl-auto. And for the time being, we're going to set this to create drop. And what create drop does is going to create the database schema. Then whenever we go to shut down the database, it's going to clear out that database schema. And this is useful whenever you're first starting development. And then once you get done with that, you're going to want to change this to update, which is only going to update the schema whenever you need it updated rather than deleting everything and losing all of your data over and over again. So this is going to finish up our application.properties. We can go ahead and save unknown code from the future here. I was editing and I found a small typo that I forgot to fix here on line nine. This needs to be an equal sign, not a colon. Just so you all know, you can fix that up. Now back to the coding. And now we should be able to actually go into our Spring Boot dashboard and hit start on our application. And we should at least be able to see that, hey, this is working and it's running. As you see, it started. It might have had a couple of errors because it can't find some queries and stuff like that. Uh, as we see, let's see what this error is. Um, I'm not seeing it. Typically, it's because it can't find something. Oh, it's probably because it couldn't find our database because we need to make that database file. But everything is working out all right. And that actually tells us that we do need to go ahead and make that file. For this, we need to go back into this so we can make a new folder. I'm going to right click and make a new folder and I'm going to call this data because that is where we're storing it data. And then I'm going to make a new file and I'm just going to call this demo. And now all of the data is going to go inside here. And if we live reload our server, I forgot to slash in the data and save. And now we should be getting rid of that exception or that error. There we go. So always remember the slash after file. And now that's all good to go. No more errors inside the console whenever we're starting it up and we can start actually developing the application that we are set out to. There's many different ways that we can actually set up our application, different layers and things like that. Some people like to keep it in like domain models. So for example, everything related to a user or everything related to, I don't know, a log or everything related to a post. I like to break my layers up into like service layer, model layer, controller layer, and then any other layers like repositories and anything else that we might need. So for the time being, what what I'd like to do is just go ahead and set up some of the layers. Firstly, I want to start with the controller layer and just make a quick request mapping to a slash. That way we can see that we can make access to it. We haven't added any spring security or anything like that yet. And then I'll show you what happens whenever we actually do add spring security. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to go ahead and right click on our com.unknowncoder and create a new package. And this is going to be our controller package. So I'm just going to name that controllers and open this up. And then inside of our controller package, we're going to have a new class name. We're going to call this user controller. So this is going to be user related request. We're not going to go that deep as when I show you guys locking everything down and all of that good stuff. So we do need a few annotations. So first we need an at rest controller annotation. And of course, this is going to come from spring web. We also need another annotation called at request mapping. And we are going to map this controller to slash user. And we need to also import this. And finally, we're also just going to do this a quick and dirty way. We're just going to add cross origin. You'd want to prevent cross origin to basically just specifically your IP or your port or your whatever. I'm going to just say at everything just to make things simple. You'd want to be a little bit more secure than this. So we need at cross origin. And inside we're going to have a star inside of quotes and let's go ahead and import this as well. And now we are ready to start setting up our first user controller inside of our user controller class. What we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to make a very simple Git mapping, which is going to map to a Git request that we can make from something called postman. First, let's make a public method that returns a string called hello user controller. Inside of this, we're just going to return some text saying user access level because this is going to signify that, hey, this is accessible by a user. And then the last thing that we need to do is we need to go ahead and map this to a specific endpoint inside of slash user. So for that, we're going to go above it. We're going to need a new annotation called at git mapping. 
And to keep this somewhat restful, we're going to just say slash. Go ahead and import this. So now what we've got here is a quick application. It's not talking to a database or anything like that currently. What it's going to say is if we go to localhost 8080 slash user slash, it's going to print out user access level. And eventually we're going to lock this down so that only users can access this. And we also want to make one more controller really quick inside the controller package called admin controller. So let's go ahead and do that. So we're going to go ahead and click on new and we're going to make a class called admin controller. And inside here, we're going to need the same exact annotations. We're going to need at rest controller to make this a component of spring. We're going to need at request mapping to tell spring, hey, we want this to be mapped to slash admin. And finally, we need at cross origin. That way we can make requests across different origins. So this is going to be more useful whenever you get into building your actual front end. That way you're not getting blocked by cores. Now inside of admin controller, I just want to make one more quick git mapping similarly to how we did to the user controller. Let's go ahead and make a quick string method that just returns admin level access similar to how we did for the user controller. And as I said, this is just going to return a string of text saying admin level access. Similarly to how we had in the user controller, we need another at git mapping above this. That way we can say, hey, we want another route inside the admin controller. And the route that we're going to use is just slash. So again, this is going to be somewhat restful. So if we access HTTP colon slash slash localhost colon 8000 slash admin slash, we're going to get the admin level access. As we get going down the tutorial, we're going to start locking these down. That way a normal user cannot access admin level stuff. We're going to make it so that an admin can access access admin level stuff and user level stuff and then someone who's not logged in at all won't be able to access anything whenever we save our server restarted and everything is good to go now what i'd like to do is go ahead and open up an application called postman and actually attempt to make a request to each one of these routes this is what our postman looks like what i want to go ahead and do is go up to this plus mark and i want to make a new request to http colon slash slash localhost 8000 slash user slash. So now if we make a git request to localhost 8000 slash user slash, we should get text back saying user level access. Let's go ahead and attempt it. As you see, we get a 200 status and we get user level access. If we do the same thing with admin, we should get the same thing. Admin and send you see admin level access. So currently we have a very simple web application that we can send request to the backend and get a response back to our client. Typically what this is gonna end up being is some front end application stored on a web browser. What we actually wanna go ahead and do now is try to lock these down. I'll show you guys what happens after we lock these down. Back inside of our Visual Studio code, now we actually wanna go ahead and add in the Spring Security. That way we can actually lock this down and not allow just any anyone to access our data. So what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to go ahead and right click on our authenticated backend, go to Maven and open Palm file. We need to add a new starter in here, the Spring Boot Starter Security. That way we can actually add in Spring Security. And by default, Spring Security locks everything down so you can't access anything whatsoever. So anywhere is fine inside the Palm. I'm just going to put it right here in this empty space. We need to start out by just adding dependency inside of angled brackets. And whenever we enter, it should close them for us. I guess not. So we'll add a closing tag as well. And inside of the dependency is where we're going to store the information. We need a group ID and an artifact ID, and then Maven will handle the rest. First, we want to start out with group ID. And this is going to be org.springframework.boot. And then we also need the artifact ID. The artifact ID is going to be spring-boot-starter-security. Now, if we save, it might automatically reload. So it does say a build with the build file is modified. Do you want to synchronize? Sure. Go ahead and synchronize. And this should go ahead and grab the dependencies that we need. And this should have automatically locked down our application. So to test to see if Spring Security is working, we can go back into Postman and we can attempt to make a request to slash admin again. And we should get a 401. So Spring Security is not working. We had to stop the application and then maybe rebuild and then start the application again. And now whenever we come back into Postman and hit send, you can see we get a 401 unauthorized. If we also go into user and say the same thing, 
We also get 401 unauthorized. This is because by default, Spring Security is going to lock everything down. And that is a good thing. Now we want to tell Spring Security what we do want to allow and don't want to allow. And now we can start getting into that Spring Security configuration that you guys are curious about. If we actually come back into VS Code and if we scroll up a little bit inside of our terminal, and I'm going to make a terminal a little bit bigger as well, you should see that using a generated security password. So what does this actually mean? So whenever Spring Security does set things up automatically, it's going to do something called a form login. So if we actually go into a web browser really quick, and if we type in HTTP colon slash slash localhost colon 8000 slash user slash it's actually going to open up a login window. And by default, this is something like admin. And then you want this password that was inside of VS code. So if you copy this code and go back into your window and sign in, maybe it's user. I forget what the username is, but you can see now again, we have user level access. So our goal here is to have to make it so we don't have to use that login screen anymore. We actually want to just be able to make a get request or a post request, for example, with the user's credentials and be able to get the token and allow ourselves to actually be able to access the information without going through this hassle. We don't need our palm open anymore. So we can go ahead and close that and we do not need our controllers open either. What we're going to want to go ahead and do is we're going to want to make a new package for security and we're going to want to set up some spring security configurations. So what we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to right click on unknown coder. And we're going to make a new package and we're going to call this configuration. And inside of our configuration package, we're going to make a new class called security configuration. The first thing that we need to do is we need to tell Spring that this is a configuration class and to look for beans inside of it to set up for us. So we need an annotation called at configuration. Inside the class, we need to set up something called a security chain. If you go back and watch some of the older Spring security applications, you'll see that they do some extending and some weird stuff. But in Spring Security 5.7, we're using 6.0 plus the web security configure adapter that you'll see in a lot of the older spring security tutorials was actually deprecated, which means that the original way of setting up the security configuration by overriding the configure method is no longer appropriate. It's deprecated. Instead, we now have spring create an instance of a security filter chain for us from an annotated app configuration class, which we're doing right now. We'll also see some other differences as we advance throughout the video as well. That means that we need to make a method that returns a security filter chain and takes takes in a HTTP security as well as throw an exception. Let's go ahead and import the things we need to import. And what we need to do is we need to actually set up this HTTP and actually build it into the security chain. So what we want to start out by doing is saying return HTTP. And we're going to set up a few things similar to like a builder. The first thing that we're going to set is CSRF, which is cross site request forgery. And we want to disable this. Next, we need to set up the authorization of the HTTP request. So if we want to get back to the point where we were before without having to sign in, we need to set these to permit all and then we'll start locking them down as we go. Finally, we want to go ahead and build this into the security chain which will set up our security for us. The last thing that we need to do is we need to tell Spring that this should be a bean. And to do that, we need to add the at bean annotation on the top of our method. Now, if we go ahead and save, it should reload our application. And now if we go back into Postman and go ahead and make a request to slash user slash, you can see we have user access level back. And if we say admin, we have admin level access back again. And now we want to go ahead and start actually locking this down the way that we want to lock it down rather than the way that Spring Security is trying to lock it down by default. At this point, we're now ready to start setting up some of our users and some of our roles and things like that. So the first thing that we're going to want to do is set up our models. So I'm going to go ahead and right click on unknown coder, make a new package, and I'm going to make our models package. And inside the models package, I'm going to go ahead and make a new class called role. Now this role is going to be special because it's going to implement a interface from the Spring Security framework called Granted Authority. And this is basically going to be how Spring Security can actually know what the user is allowed to do with different data. So what I need to do is go ahead and write implements Granted Authority here. And go ahead and import that. 
Now it's going to complain because it needs to implement some method. So we can go ahead and click on the light bulb and add unimplemented methods. Now we want this to be something that we actually persist in the database. That way we can have some database table of roles. So I'm going to go ahead and annotate this to actually be stored inside of a database. So we need to go up over top of the class and we need to add a couple annotations. The first one being at entity. At entity is going to tell Spring Data JPA that this is a model that we want to persist in the database. And then we also want the at table annotation. At table is a optional annotation, but it allows us to name the table however we want. That way it's easier to find and it kind of follows our naming conventions. I like to name my database tables with plural, so I'm going to name this roles. Now we also need to go ahead and import the at table annotation and we're good to go on that front. Now inside of our class, we need the actual properties that we want to store inside the table. So the first thing that we're going to need is we're going to need an ID. All of our tables need a primary key. So I'm just going to call this private integer role ID. And to actually save this as a primary key inside the database, we need a couple more annotations. So the first annotation we need is at ID from Jakarta. Then we need at generated value. Technically you don't, but it's going to make our lives a little bit easier. And inside of here, we want a strategy and we're going to set that equal to generation type dot auto. We need to go ahead and import a generated value. And now finally, we can also add an at column annotation. At column is actually optional, but it's used to add restrictions and other things to the column. I want to name the column with snake case. So basically, I want to name it role underscore ID. And this is how we're going to do this. And inside, we're going to say name equal to role underscore ID. We need to go ahead and import our column and we're good to go there. Next, we actually need the role. In our case, I'm gonna be calling this authority because this is gonna match up a little bit better with spring security. So I'm just gonna make a private string authority. Then we just need our basic constructors as well as getters and setters. So let's go ahead and set those up really quickly. The get authority getter method was already generated for us because we went ahead and implemented this granted authority interface. So what we need to do is instead of throwing an unsupported operation exception, what we actually need to do is go ahead and return the authority that we put on this role. And of course, we need a public setter method to just go ahead and set this authority. And then also we need our getters and our setters for our role ID. So let's go ahead and get those done real quick. All right, and that should be good to go on our role class. Now that our roles table is set up and our roles model is set up, we can go ahead and make our application user model, which will be used to actually store the user into the database. So we'll go ahead and go to our models once again and hit the new file and go ahead and make a application user. Once again, we are going to make our lives a little bit easier on the Spring Security front and implement a interface that Spring Security provides to us called user details. So let's go ahead and do that and go ahead and import user details and then go ahead and implement the unimplemented methods. These are all very easy. I'll fix them up and show you what to do with them in a second. Again, we're going to use the user details to actually know what the information is about the user and then be able to actually say, hey, this user is allowed, this user is not allowed type of thing. So we're going to do the same exact thing that we did in roles. We're going to go to the top and we're going to add at entity. And we're going to add at table. And the name of this table is going to be users an import table. And now this is going to store the information in a user's table. Now we're going to need the primary key. We're just going to add a private integer user ID. And just like last time, we need at ID above this. So at ID, we also need at generated value. And our generated value needs a strategy. I'm just going to use auto once again. And go ahead and import our generated value. And we'll add an at column just so that we can name this user underscore ID. Then import column. Now we have a couple other properties. The next one is private string username. Then we want the property private string password. And then we need a set of authorities or basically a set of the roles for this user. For this, we're going to use a private set of role and then call that authorities. We need to go ahead and import set. 
And we also have to do one more thing with this one. Since we are having a set of roles, we need to either do some sort of mini to something mapping for our database. So technically speaking, many roles can be attached to many users or the other way around, many users may have many roles. So we're gonna use the at mini to mini annotation. And inside here, we're going to tell it that the fetch type is gonna be eager. What this is going to say is that we want to fetch the data for the authorities as soon as we fetch the user information. Now we need to tell Spring JPA where to store this main to mini information and we're going to put it inside of a junction table. So to do that, we're going to need the at join table annotation. And inside of at join table, we're going to need a few properties. First one being name. And a convention that people use for junction tables is to say the first table, second table junction. So I'm going to call this user underscore role underscore junction. Next, we need the join columns or the columns from this specific table that we're in right now. And to do this, we're going to have to say equal to inside here. We're going to say at join column from J Jakarta. For some reason earlier was not trying to import it. And we're going to say name is going to be equal to user underscore ID. Then we need inverse join columns. And this is going to be the column to join or the name of the column from the other table. But once again, we need to add join column. And this one is going to be name equal to role underscore ID. Go ahead and import join table and save. And we should be good for now. It might still air out, but it's going to be okay. We'll fix it up. Finally, let's set up a couple of our constructors. First, we'll do a no argument constructor. That way we can set the authorities to at least something empty instead of null. Go ahead and import hash set. Then we'll go ahead and do an all argument constructor. Now I need to set up a few of the getters and setters. As we can see, our get authorities is already set up, except we need to return the authorities instead of returning this throw new exception. Let's go ahead and set up a setter for that. It set up a get password for us, although we need to change it to go ahead and return the password. Let's go ahead and set up a setter for that. They've also set up a get username. So here, once again, we want to get rid of this and just return this dot username. We need to go ahead and set up a set username. And then now we have a couple of spring security things that is set up for us. So this one is, is account non-locked. So basically if you set this to false, that means that the accounts can be locked down. If you set it to true, the account is usable. So for us, we're just going to set it up so that the account's usable. So let's go ahead and return true here. The next one is account non-locked. Once again, if you set this to false, that's going to mean, hey, it's not working anymore. You can't access the account. We want to go ahead and set this one to return true. Next one is credentials non-expired. Once again, if you want to lock your users out or something along those lines, you can go ahead and have some actual logic for this. We're just going to set true once again. And finally, is account enabled? This is something else. So you can say, hey, once you register, you have to verify your account. Once you verify your account, we'll unlock it. I'm doing that in my Let's Build Twitter series. But for us, I'm just going to go ahead and set this to true once again. Now our entire models are set up and ready to go. And we're ready to start actually being able to take in requests, storing users on the database, checking their credentials, and actually making JWTs and all of that good stuff that we're trying to work towards. After having our application use complete, what we can do is actually create a new package for our services and we can start setting up the actual logic to go ahead and authenticate a user and get moving on that. So let's go ahead and close out of our models that we just created and let's go ahead and right click and make a new package and call this services. And inside of services, we are going to make a new class called user service. 
Now the user service is going to be the actual class or the actual service that goes ahead and determines whether or not the user's username and password match up. What we're going to want to go ahead and do is we're going to want to go ahead and implement user detail service. And what user detail service will do is it's going to enable ourselves to specify how we want Spring Security to look for our user during authentication. For the time being, what we're going to do is we're going to hard code a user in here so I can show you guys how it's working. And then we're going to modify the configuration file to make sure everything is working as expected before actually connecting it to a database. Of course, once we have our user detail service, we want to go ahead and import this. And now it's going to complain because it doesn't have the methods that it's wanting. So let's go ahead and import the methods. And this load user by username is actually going to go through and look for the user that we want and actually say, hey, yes, this is working properly or no, it's not working properly. The first thing that we're going to need inside of our user service class is a password encoder. I'm going to go ahead and just auto wire this now. And then in the future, in the next step, we are going to go ahead and show you guys how we get this password encoder. So we need to go ahead and import a private password encoder and import this password encoder. Then we want to use the auto wire annotation above this to go ahead and auto wire a bean of password encoder and go ahead and import auto wired. This is going to fail for the time being because it's not going to be able to find a bean of type encoder. That is completely fine. We'll fix this in a little bit. Inside of our load by username, I just want to make a quick tracing print statement here that way we can actually see that our application is inside this user service. And inside of the print statement, let's just print out that we're in the user detail service. So now from here, let's go ahead and just see if the user's username is Ethan. If the user's username is not Ethan, then we're going to throw a new exception. Otherwise, we're going to go and return a new user called Ethan. Cool. Now we need to go ahead and set up Ethan's roles. So let's go ahead and make a new set of roles. Let's go ahead and make sure our set is imported. Now let's make sure our role is imported from models. And we'll also go ahead and make sure our hash set is imported as well. Let's go ahead and add a single role called user. And then finally, we need a return statement and go ahead and return a new application user with our username and the password encoded. Let's go ahead and import our application user from here. And what this is going to go ahead and do is it's going to check to see if our username matches what we expect. If it does, we're going to return a new application user with a random ID. This is obviously just temporary. The person's username as well as the password. This encoder.encode, we'll see a little bit more of this later, but this is basically going to hash our password for us. We also are going to use the same encoder to unhash it or whatever, or check the hash, whatever you want to call. And then finally, it has roles of user. And then if the username is not equal to Ethan, it's not the person we're looking for, it's going to throw a new username not found exception. And what's going to happen with Spring Security in a second is that it's going to say, hey, we found an application user. That means that this person is good to go. That's the username and password. Otherwise, if it doesn't, it's going to say, hey, this user is not who we're looking for. Now, before this user detail service is actually of use to us, we actually have to go back into the configuration file and set up a couple of things there. Back inside of our security configuration file, what we're going to need to do is one, we need to set up a password encoder, and that's the thing that we're using inside of our detail service. We also need to set up the authentication manager, which is going to basically say, hey, how are we authenticating these users? Let's first go ahead and set up our password encoder. What we need once again is the app being annotation. Then we need a public method, which returns a password encoder. From inside this method, what we want to do is go ahead and return a new bcrypt password encoder. Go ahead and import our bcrypt and import our password encoder. Now, anywhere that we need a password encoder, it's going to return the singular bean of the bcrypt password encoder that we created here. Now, we need an authentication manager. Like I mentioned before, this is how Spring Securities actually go through and figure out whether or not this user is actually supposed to be authenticated or not. So once again, we're going to need the annotation app bean. And below the app bean annotation, we need a public method that returns an authentication manager and takes in a user detail service. So now this method is going to have to set up a couple of things. The first thing we're going to want is a DAO authentication provider because we are eventually going to be using a DAO. We just want to set this to a new DAO authentication provider. 
Now we need to go ahead and set this DAO authentication provider's user service. That way it knows where and how to look for the user to authenticate. Finally, we need to go ahead and create a new provider manager, passing in this DAO authentication provider inside the constructor and return that out of this method. Now we are missing a few imports. Let's go ahead and import everything that we need. So we need the authentication manager. Let's go ahead and import the user detail service from Spring Security. We need the DAO authentication provider from Spring Security. And finally, we need the provider manager from Spring Security and save. And it appears we forgot to add the at service above our user service. So let's go ahead and fix that. So above our service classes, we do need the at service annotation. That way it's going to tell Spring, hey, make a bean of this type. And save. And now it should be able to configure for us. For some reason, sometimes VS Code is a little bit finicky. All I had to do is save again and not fix whatever error was there. Now to show that our user service is being used properly as a user detail service, we're going to have to go ahead and modify our security configuration a little bit. The first thing that we're going to want to do is go ahead and get rid of the permit all and actually say authenticated instead. Now, instead of what it's going to do, anytime we try to make a request, it's going to force us to authenticate in some way. And in this way, instead of being stateless for the time being, we're going to set this to HTT basic, which is basically saying, hey, pass in your username and your password through an HTTP form, and then we'll go ahead and authenticate it that way. I'm not sure why it's throwing a hissy fit, but it's going to be fine. So now if we went ahead and opened up Postman again for our HTTP colon slash slash localhost 8000 slash user, if we want to make this request currently, it's going to show us a 401. As you see, 401 unauthorized. It's showing 401 unauthorized because we did not pass in a username and password. So what we're going to go and do now is go up into authorization, and then we're going to go ahead and say basic auth, and then we want to put in the username. So I had a username from before. But let's just say Ethan, and then we're going to go ahead and put in the password as P A S S. And this should also go ahead and say 401 because the password is not right. As you see, password is unauthorized. It didn't pass in the correct password. And if we go back into our VS code, you're going to see that we have our trace message here saying that we were in the user detail service. So what happened is whenever we made the request into our user controller, our security configuration said, hey, this needs to be authenticated because any request needs to be authenticated. It says, hey, OK, our auth manager is user detail service. So then it went into our user detail service and it checked to see, OK, we did get a user back but the password is supposed to be password. The password that we got was P-A-S-S. -S. Back inside Spring Security, if I actually passed in password properly and sent the request, you should see now we got user access level because we actually had the correct username and we had the correct password. If we go ahead and put an incorrect username, it's also gonna send back a 401. As you can see here, we're, we're unauthorized because the username is not correct. So now at this point, we have gotten our application locked down to the point where we had to pass in a username and password with every single request. Now we do not want to have to do this. What we actually want to be able to do is send in our username and password just once, have the application send back a token for us, and then put that into a auth token or a bearer token as we see here. Instead, that way it's just a little bit easier. And then the back end also doesn't have to hold any state either. Now we're at the point where we're ready to go ahead and insert some users and some roles into a database table and actually go ahead and query that table to see if that user exists or not and if their password is proper or not. So to do that, we're going to need the repository layers. So let's go ahead and go into our unknown coder and make a new package and call this repository. And inside of a repository package, let's first make a user repository class. So we are going to be using Spring Data JPA. So what we actually want to do is we want to turn this class into an interface. And since we are using JPA repository, what we need to do is we need to make this user repository interface extend the JPA repository interface. Now inside of our JPA repository interface type parameters, what we need to pass in is the model we're trying to store or query out the database, as well as the type of the ID for that model. We need to go ahead and import our JPA repository and go ahead and import our application user. 
Now, this is not a tutorial for Spring Data JPA. However, what Spring Data JPA does is it's just going to go ahead and generate a whole bunch of queries for you. Basically, a bunch of CRUD operations, some pagination, and some other things. All you need to do is go ahead and specify specific queries that you want inside of your repository. Basically, all we're going to actually want for our user repository outside of our basic CRUD methods is going to be able to find a user by the username because this is how we're actually going to see if a user exists in the database. And and then log them in. So what we're going to want to do is make a new method that returns an optional application user. And we need to name this find user by username because this is how Spring Data JPA is actually going to set up the query for us. Let's go ahead and import our optional. And now thanks to Spring Data JPA, our entire user repository is finished for us. Before moving on to the next repository, we do need to make sure we go ahead and mark this with at repository on the top. Now Spring will create this as a repository for us. Now that our user repository is finished, let's go ahead and go up to a repository again and make a new class. And let's go ahead and call this role repository. Once again, our role repository should be an interface. And the interface should extend to JPA repository. And inside the typed parameters, we need role and integer. Let's go ahead and import role and JPA repository. Once again, we only need one specialized query out of this. So let's go ahead and make an optional method once again. And this one is going to be find by authority. That way we can search for roles by their authority. Go ahead and import our optional. And now our user repository and role repository are finished. There's one last thing that I want to do before we start working on modifying some code. And that's to make sure both of our roles are in the database before we try to register new users, as well as making sure there is an admin user. That way the admin can do some administrative tasks if we ever wanted to. This is because it's probably not a good idea to let someone sign up as an admin, because if you allow that, then you might have random users signing up for your website or for your API that can say, hey, I'm an admin and get access to things that you don't want them to it's better to have some administrative role that can go ahead and update some other users role to admin and allow them to be admin that way rather than the other way around so what we're going to want to do next is go into our authenticated backend application and before we get too ahead of ourselves here working on inserting new users and roles into the database let's go ahead and throw on the at repository above the role repository this is not strictly required, but I do like to make sure that we do go ahead and annotate all of our repository classes. The authenticated backend application is the main method or the main entry point of our Spring Boot application. It's going to set everything up for us. And what we want to do inside here is we want to go ahead and set up something called a command line runner, which is going to run some code as soon as our application starts up. And the reason that we want to do this is because we want to make sure that whenever we spin up our application, after we went ahead and destroyed all of our schema, we want to make sure that we at least have an admin user in here and we also have the roles that we need we can actually do that with the role repository and the user repository as well as running it with the command line runner so to do that we're going to go ahead and go into this main class and we want to use the at bean annotation over a method that returns a command line runner and the method that returns the command line runner we're just going to conveniently call run this method is going to take in a few things, namely the things that we want to inject. So we're going to need to inject the role repository, the user repository, and a password encoder. Now we need to go ahead and make sure that we import all of this stuff. So we need to go ahead and import our command line runner. We need to import our role repository. We need to import our user repository. And we need to import our password encoder. And these are automatically going to be injected for us. Now it's complaining because we need to go ahead and return some command line runner. To do that, we're going to use the Lambda function. So we're going to say return and an arrow and then args. And then on the inside of here, we can actually run our logic. So the first thing we need to do is we need to go ahead and make our roles. The first role we're going to go ahead and store into our variable because we're going to apply that role onto a user. Let's go ahead and import role. Anytime our application starts up, it's going to add in this role. Let's go ahead and add the user type role. Now we have our user role saved. Now what we're going to want to do is going to go ahead and set up the roles for our admin user. So to do that, I'm going to go ahead and make a new set of roles called roles. Go ahead and import everything we need. So we'll need a set and a hash set.
Now let's go ahead and add this admin role into our roles. And finally, let's go ahead and make this new application user that we'll call admin. Now we need to go ahead and import our application user. And now this is actually ready to go ahead and save. So now we need the user repository save. Now that is all good to go. The final thing that I do want to go ahead and do is what if we turn off the create drop and then turn it into update. So we're going to need some way to check to see if something exists in there. And if the, for example, if the admin role already exists, that means that the user role must exist. And also the admin must exist because this command line runner has run. So we want to go ahead to check to see if this exists. So we can do that with a simple if statement. And inside the if statement, we can go ahead and call the role repository that find by authority. Then we want to go ahead and pass an admin. However, you'll see that there is an issue here. There's an issue here because this doesn't actually return a row. It's actually going to return optional. So what we can go ahead and do is we can go ahead and say dot is present. So if we find it, we want to go ahead and just return to exit out of this method. And there we go. So now our command line runner is set up. Anytime our application restarts and we had tore down our database, it's going to go ahead and reinsert all this information. Otherwise, it's just going to skip over it and then we can go ahead and move on as well. Now that our application is set up to go ahead and preload that admin user as well as those rules, we're going to want to go ahead and head into the user service once again. And now instead of loading the user from some random name that we hard code, we can actually grab that from the user repository. Back inside our user service, the first thing that we're going to want to do is go ahead and get an instance of our user repository. And what we're going to want to go ahead and do is import our user repository. And we also want to auto wire this. Now that we have access to our user repository, I'm going to keep our in user detail service just for the time being. Keep in mind, you don't want to keep any system out prints inside your application. It slows everything down. It's just not great. It's better to log, but I do want to go ahead and remove all the information we have in here and we're going to set up a new return. So now what we want to do is go ahead and return if there is a user in the database with our username. Otherwise, we're going to want to go ahead and throw a new username not found. And this is really simple because we used an optional. So let's go ahead and first try to find the user by username and then we want to pass whatever username that the user passed in the request and now since this is an optional it's not just going to automatically return the user so it's either going to have a user inside this optional or it's going to be empty if our optional is empty we're actually going to want to go ahead and throw a new username not found exception and we can do that very easily using the dot or else throw and then a lambda calling the username not found exception constructor and then we can put whatever message we want. I'm just going to say user is not valid inside of our exception here. You got to love that VS Code doesn't persist to word wrap across every file, but it's, it is what it is. So now what's going to happen is whenever we go through and try to log a user in using HTTP basic, instead of doing some hard coded username like Ethan, for example, it's actually going to call the user repository, which will go to our database, find the user in there if it exists. Otherwise, it'll throw an exception. So if we head back into Postman one last time, and if we try to log in with Ethan and password, we should get a 401 because the user with username Ethan does not exist inside of our database. As you see, we get 401 unauthorized. However, we do have a user called admin and a password of password. So theoretically, if we call admin and password, we should get the response back saying user access. As you see, we get user access level because we actually have an admin and password in there. And if we mess up the password, it's not going to work as well. We should get a 401. Now we are pretty close. We can go ahead and actually search on our database for a user and authenticate them. But now we want to go ahead and make sure that the user can actually just log in once and verify off that instead of having to pass this username and password every single time. We are able to access our routes and everything with the admin user, but we're not able to actually create any new users to be able to access our application. And that's probably most likely what you're going to want to end up doing. So what we're going to go ahead and do now is make it so that we can allow other people to actually register their accounts and then log into their accounts later on. So what we're going to need to do is go ahead and make a new class inside of our services. And I'm going to go ahead and click on the plus. This will make a new class and we're going to go ahead and call this authentication service. And inside the authentication service, I do want to go ahead and remember to throw the at service annotation on the top of this. 
And what at service is going to do is it's going to allow Spring to go ahead and create this class as a bean for us. The other thing that I want to go ahead and throw on this is at transactional. We want to make sure this transactional comes from the Spring framework because we want Spring to go ahead and manage our transactions between the database and the application. And the reason why we're putting this on the service layer is because this is where we're actually going to be calling the database layer. And this is where we're going to want to make our transactions. And what transaction basically does is it's going to make sure that we're going to treat every single one of our methods inside this authentication service as a single transaction. So that way, if we're doing multiple database calls and changing multiple pieces of data in the data, database and things of that sort, if a method ends up failing or something along those lines, it's going to go ahead and cancel out that transaction and the database isn't going to be messed with. Now we can go ahead and work on the inside of our authentication service. And the first thing we're going to need is we're going to need to go ahead and pull in our dependencies. Some people may only want services to talk to services. Other companies may allow repos any repository to talk to any service. Typically, I just go ahead and allow different services to talk to different repositories. So what we're going to want to do is go ahead and pull in the user repository because we want to go ahead and allow user to go ahead and search for themselves or maybe register themselves. And then let's go ahead and import our repository. We also are going to want to go ahead and just throw at auto wired. Typically, you'd probably want to make a constructor here and do constructor injection, but I'm just going to do this dirty and fast. So go ahead and throw at auto wired above this. After we add in our user repository, whenever we create a user, we're also going to want to go ahead and look for a role to attach to that user or roles, I guess, multiple roles to attach to that user. So let's go ahead and pull in the role repository. Once again, let's go ahead and import role repository. And we'll also need to go ahead and throw at auto wired above the top of this. Finally, whenever we create a user and whenever we actually go through and search for a user later on, we're going to need to go ahead and know how to encode the password. Otherwise, Spring Security is not going to know what's going on with the password. Let's go ahead and bring in the password encoder. As always, go ahead and import this. And we'll also want to go ahead and auto wire this as well. So now that we've got all of the dependencies that we need for the time being, we can go ahead and start working on a register method. Typically, what I'd probably want to do here is instead of returning the entire register user, we'd probably want to go ahead and create a user DTO to pass the user information over instead of passing in the authenticated password and all of that good stuff. Or what you can do is inside the user model above the password field, you can go ahead and throw at JSON ignore. Either one of these is going to work. For the time being, I'm not going to deal with this. I just want to set up a very simple backend. So just keep that in mind. You don't want to be sending over the password because even if it is encrypted, that's still not good practice. What we're going to want to go ahead and do next is go ahead and make a new method that returns an application user and takes in their specified username and password. We need to go ahead and import our application user that way we can use it. Right now it's airing out because it's not returning anything. So let's go ahead and just return null for the time being to get that to go away. Now, the first thing inside of our register user method is we want to go ahead and take that password and make sure it's encoded before we put it onto the database. And the way that we're going to do this is we're going to use the password encoder encode method. This is going to spit out an encoded password with whatever encryption algorithm that you're using. Now we need to go ahead and set the roles. Whenever we register a new user, as we mentioned in a previous section, we are just going to assign them role user. And later on, if you wanted to code something in to allow them to have admin access, you can go ahead and do that. And how we're going to go ahead and get the user role is that we're going to use the role repository dot find by authority with the role name of user, or in our case, the authority of name user. And then we have to use a dot get method because this is an optional this is not actually returning the role itself we need to go ahead and import our role that way we can use this and make sure it comes from our models and not some and not from somewhere else now we have our password encoded we have our role we need to go ahead and make a set of roles for our authorities we need to go ahead and import our set and hash set and we need to go ahead and add the user role to our authority set. Now that we have our password encoded and we have our user role and authorities all set up, we can go ahead and create the new user and store them inside the database. To do this, we're going to go ahead and use the user repository.save method. And then we'll go ahead and just create a new application user with a random ID, the username, the encoded password, as well as the authority. So we want to set with it. 
And just like that, our application user will be saved into the database anytime this register user with a username and password is passed in. Now, something that's worth mentioning and something that I completely forgot about or blanked out about whenever we set up our models is that all we're doing is passing in a username and password into the create new user method, basically. And this could be an issue with our username because what if we accidentally have someone with the same username, but they have different passwords. So just a kind of bit of a forethought, you'd probably want to go ahead and throw at column and then unique equal to true on the top of the private string username. So we need to go ahead and import at column. Now the usernames cannot be the same and then we shouldn't run into an issue with someone having the same username, but obviously different passwords. This method is pretty useless at this point because we have no way of actually calling it. To call it, we're gonna need some HTTP endpoint and to create an HTTP endpoint, we're going to need a controller. So let's go ahead and go up to our controller package and create a new class called authentication controller. Once again, we need to remember to throw on our annotations on the top. First, we're gonna need at rest controller. Once again, at rest controller is going to allow us to map endpoints to our servlets in the back end. We're also going to want to go ahead and add at request mapping. And at request mapping is going to allow us to map this controller to a specific endpoint. For us, we're going to use slash auth. Last but not least, we can go ahead and throw at cross origins on this just to be safe. That way we're not getting blocked by any cores issues. In this case, I'm just going to throw star in here. This is definitely not best practice. However, I don't really care at this point. You guys want to lock this down to only allow maybe specific request types. If you really want to get into the nitty gritty, you can even do this inside of the security configuration. Again, I'm not here to show you guys this part. I just want to show you all how we can load uses from the database, go ahead and authenticate them and give them a JWT. That way it's log in every single time. Inside of our authentication controller, we're going to want to go ahead and have an instance of the authentication service. That way we can actually call our register user. Go ahead and make sure we import our authentication service. And then we also need to go ahead and throw at auto wired above this. That way spring will automatically inject this for us. Now we can go ahead and go about mapping our endpoints. The first endpoint we're going to need is to be able to register a user. So to do that, we're going to need a public method that returns an application user. And we'll just call this register user. And then we'll need to go ahead and import our application user so this stops complaining. And inside, we'll go ahead and return our authentication service dot register user with just blanks for now. We need to go ahead and add the app post mapping annotation on the top. We'll go ahead and get this endpoint of slash register. Once again, go ahead and import our post mapping. So now this is the route setup. Currently, we're not passing in any information. And this is because I don't want to pass in an entire application user every single time we want to register someone, especially when all we need is username, password. And whenever the application has username, password, ID, roles, and all of that stuff, we're just doing ourselves to service if we make our front end pass in all the information that we don't need. So what we're going to go ahead and do instead is we're going to make a new class inside the models. And I'm going to call this registration DT. So this is going to be a registration data transfer object. It's not going to be mapped to the database or anything like that. And technically speaking, you could put this into a DTO package. I'm just being a little bit lazy. You guys do your code however you like. I'm just doing this to be quick and simple. And all we're going to have here is a couple of things. We're going to have a private string username. We're going to have a private string password. And then we're simply just going to have our constructors and getters and setters. And in our case, I am going to go ahead and write up a very quick to string. That way we can go ahead and print out this object to make sure everything looks good. That is our very, very quick and dirty registration DTO. Let's go ahead and hop back into our authentication controller to make use of it. Now inside of our authentication controller, what we're going to want to do is inside of this register user, we're going to want to take in some information in the parameters. What we're going to want is an at request body, and then we're going to take in that new registration DTO object. And let's go ahead and import our new registration DTO. And what at request body is going to say is that it'll say, hey, we are expecting some body or we are expecting some data from this post request and that data is going to be mapped to this registration DTO object. So now what we can do is instead of having these empty quotations, we can go ahead and say body.get username and we can say body.get password. 
So we're literally just using this registration DTO to transfer data from the request into our backend. That way we can more easily register the user. Now, even though we have this authentication control endpoint to slash register, we still can't quite connect to the backend. And if we tried, I'll show you what happens. So if we want to go ahead and try to register a new user currently, if we go up to the top and make a new post request to HTTP colon slash slash localhost colon 8000 slash auth slash register and then we need to go ahead and put in some data so we're going to go into the body and then we're going to go into raw json and inside here we need a username field which can just be ethan for the time being then we need a password field and this can just be password so if we try to register a new user currently and we send the request, we're going to get a 401 unauthorized because everything is still locked down. We need to go back into the security configuration and actually allow people to hit this endpoint even though they're not authenticated yet. So coming back into our application, let's go ahead and open up our configuration. And inside of security configuration, we need to go ahead and modify our security filter chain. And inside of our authorized HTTP request, we're going to want to add some new information. So we're going to go to the end of the Lambda. We're going to add some curly braces because we're going to have multiple lines of code. And that now needs a semicolon. And above our auth.anyRequest.authenticated, we're going to want to go ahead and add auth.requestmatchers. And then we're going to want to go ahead and add the route that we want to match, which is going to be slash auth. And we're going to add slash star star to go ahead and match any nested routes within auth. And what we're going to want to do is instead of this being authenticated, we're going to want to allow literally any user to access this. So we're going to say dot permit all. So now what this is going to allow us to do is it's going to allow literally any user to access the slash auth endpoint. That way they can basically either sign up or log in a little bit. And then every other endpoint is going to go ahead and be locked down. So now if we go ahead and hop back into Postman and we go ahead and try to resend this request with Ethan and password. You should see that now we get a user back with an ID2. Again, you don't really want to return the password. You'd probably want to do like a DTO to get rid of this. You also see the authorities. You might not want to see the authorities, enable true and all of this good stuff. So now we're able to go ahead and create new users. And what we should be able to do now is take this user Ethan and then go back into our slash user. And we should be able to go ahead and say authorization and put Ethan and password back in here and password make sure i spelled password correctly and now we should once again see the user access level with ethan uh, because we created a brand new account and now we can access that account and at this point we are able to create new users and we can even access the controllers that we have locked down against username and password authentication but we don't want to authenticate against the user's username and password with every single request instead we want to use a stateless system that checks for a jwt token in the header of every request to determine whether the user is authorized to view certain endpoints to do this when Need to go ahead and use the OAuth resource server and its dependencies such as the Nimbus library to generate, read, and decode JWTs for us. So first thing they'll have to do for this is go ahead and create an RSA key pair to be able to generate our JWTs. So with that we need to go ahead and hop back into our VS code and we're going to want to go ahead and make a new package called utils. So to do that we'll go up to our com to unknown coder right click make a new package and we're going to call this utils because we're going to have some utility classes in here and inside of our utils we're going to want a new class and we'll call this class key generated utility so you probably guessed it this is going to be used to generate some keys i do got to give a shout out this was originally authored by joe granja i hope i'm saying that right which was also included inside dan vega's youtube tutorial series which i got a lot of the inspiration from uh but this was set up a little bit differently and i actually adapted it to go ahead and use a single utility class rather than having the code all spread out but i still want to go ahead and shout out joe granja and dan vega because credit should be given where credit is due so this is not going to be a component or anything like that this is just going to be a public class with a static method that goes ahead and generates rsa keys for us that way we can go ahead and set up jwts but that being said let's go ahead and first create a method that is public and static and returns a key pair and we're going to call this generate rsa key so for the time being this is going to go ahead and throw a fit so let's go ahead and return null just to get that to stop 
So as previously mentioned, we actually need an RSA key pair to generate our JWT tokens to encrypt them, encode them, whatever. I'm not a perf, I don't know exactly what's going on behind the scenes with JWTs. It just needs to be secure. We need a way of coding it and decoding it with some algorithm, specifically called RSA. So what we're gonna need to do is we're gonna need to go ahead and create a key pair that we'll set in a second. And inside of a try catch block, we're gonna go ahead and try to generate this. For the time being, it's probably going to complain because we have no reason for a try catch, but it's fine. So now what we're going to need is something called a key pair generator, and we're going to get this from key pair generator dot get instance of RSA. This is going to get us an instance of a key generator that can go ahead and create RSA key pairs for us. Then we need to go ahead and initialize this. We're going to use 2048 bits. Then we need to go ahead and generate our key pair with key pair generator dot generate key pair. I accidentally typoed. This should be an uppercase P. And now we're good to go. If we have an exception, we're going to go ahead and throw a new illegal state exception. And at the bottom of the method, we want to go ahead and return that key pair that we generated. If it didn't generate properly, it's just going to throw an exception. It shouldn't be an issue. And then we can handle that exception later on. So this is going to be used to, of course, go ahead and generate a key pair to go ahead and generate and encode and decode our JWTs. And with this, we're going to need a model to actually store the key pair inside. We can't just use key pair. We're going to need something called RSA key properties. So what we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to go ahead and make a new class inside our utils. Once again, and we're going to call this RSA key properties. Now our RSA key properties is going to be a component that we're going to want spring to generate for us. So we're going to go ahead and say at component at the top. And then inside, we're going to have a couple of properties that we need to store. Firstly, we're going to have a private RSA public key. And then we're going to have a private RSA private key. Then we need to go ahead and create a special constructor. As you see, this constructor doesn't take any information. However, we are going to use the key generate utility to go ahead and generate an RSA key here and then store that into our public and private key variables. Now that we have our key pair, we can go ahead and set these to our RSA public keys. The only thing that I have to keep in mind is that the key generator just returns a generic key. So we're going to have to go ahead and cast these to the specific type of key, whether it be an RSA public key or an RSA private key. Now that we have our general constructor set up, let's go ahead and set up our getters and setters for the public and private key properties. And that will go ahead and wrap up our RSA key properties. And now before we go through and set up our JWTs, we need to actually add in the OAuth2 resource server. We're going to right click on our project, go to Maven and open up the palm file. And then under the spring security starter, we need to go ahead and add in a new dependency here. And inside the dependency, we're going to need the group ID of org.springframework.boot. And then we're going to need the artifact ID of spring dash boot dash starter dash OAuth2 dash resource dash server. Now save. VS Code is probably going to tell us to go ahead and reload. We can try. And I spelled dependency wrong, it seems. Save and try again. Yes, there we go. And then even though VS Code is going to try to do this, I am going to go ahead and stop the application. And go ahead and go up to my Maven and right click Maven and reload project just because last time VS Code didn't do a great job. Now we go ahead and go back into our security configuration and start setting up the things we need to create JWTs. Now that we have OAuth resource server all installed and everything, we need to go ahead and set up our security configuration to go ahead and use JWTs as well as create some beans to be able to actually encode and decode those. So we're going to go to the top of our configuration class. And the first thing we need to go ahead and do is we need to bring in a private file final RSA key property. We're going to call this keys and we need to go ahead and import our RSA key properties. Now this is obviously going to complain. We're going to want to go ahead and auto wire this into a constructor.
then this should get rid of that error and now whenever we go ahead and create this bean of the security configuration is going to find the component called rsaq properties and go ahead and inject it in here next let's go ahead and go below our app bean for security filter chain we're first going to go ahead and make a bean of type jwt decoder so to do this we're going to need to go ahead and use the app bean annotation and below the app bean annotation we're going to need a method which returns a jwt decoder Let's go ahead and import our JWT decoder from security.oauth2. And in here, we're going to need to go ahead and return a Nimbus JWT decoder with a public key. And we're going to get that public key from our keys property at the top of our security configuration. We need to go ahead and import our Nimbus JWT decoder. Now, this is going to be how we go ahead and take in our JWT and get the data out of it. Next, we need another bean of a JWT encoder. So once again, to do this, we're going to need the app bean annotation and a method that returns a JWT encoder. Let's go ahead and import our JWT decoder from the OAuth2.security. And inside here, we're going to need to set up a couple things. The first thing we need is a JWK. And this doesn't come from a new RSA key dot builder with our public and private keys. And now we need to go ahead and import our RSA key from Jose. Then we need to go ahead and set up a JWK source. And this is going to be called JWKS. And this is going to be equal to a new immutable JWK set with our JWK inserted into a new JWK set. Now we have quite a few things to go ahead and import here. So let's go ahead and grab our JWK set. We'll go ahead and grab our security context, which should come from Jose, where you need the immutable JWK set, which I spelled incorrectly slightly. And we'll need the JWK set from Nimbus as well. Now we can go ahead and set up our final encoder, which is going to take in the information that we just set up and return a new Nimbus JWT encoder. Once again, we need to go ahead and return the JWT Nimbus encoder. So now this is going to allow us to take in some information such as the token and the decoder will go ahead and get the data out of the token and the encoder will take some information, bundle it up and sign it with our public and private key and then spit it out for us at the end. Now there is still one last thing that we need to go ahead and set up and that is to tell our Spring security to actually use the OAuth research server and to read JWTs. So to do that, we need to go back up to a security filter chain and first we need to go ahead and get rid of our HTTP basic because we are no longer going to be authenticating that way we need to add oauth2 resource server and inside here we need to go ahead and pass oauth2 resource server configurer colon colon and we need to pass the method jwt we need to go ahead and import our oauth2 resource server configurer hopefully i spelled it correctly it looks good and then we need to go ahead and set our session management to stateless so to do that we're going to go ahead and do dot session management and inside here, we're going to need a Lambda expression. And what we want to say is we want to say session that session creation policy is going to be session creation policy dot stateless. It'd be really nice if VS code didn't cover up what I'm writing. Let's go ahead and import our session policy and that should be good to go. And we can go ahead and save. So now what it's going to do is it's going to configure a OAuth resource server for us. And it's going to know to check for JWT tokens. So now every time we send in a request that needs to be authenticated, it's going to look inside the bare token authentication header and look for a token. And then using the encoder and decoder, it's going to know how to actually look for that. And then using the public and private keys that we set up, it's going to know whether or not this is proper or not. So now that we've got this all set up, we need to go ahead and make our code be able to create our JWD tokens to send back to the client and actually decode them if we ever need that. So now to actually use our JWTs as we want, we're going to need a new service to actually create these JWTs. So once again, we'll go to our services package and hit the plus, and now we're going to make a new service called token service. At the top of our token service, let's go ahead and throw the at service annotation. And inside of our token service, we're going to need a couple of things auto wired. Firstly, we're going to auto wire the private JWT encoder. Let's go ahead and import our JWT encoder. Then we're also going to need to go ahead and auto wire a JWT decoder. We'll need to go ahead and import our JWT decoder. 
And once again, you'd probably want to use constructor injection here. I'm just doing it the quick and simple way. Now we actually need a method to generate our JWT for us so we can send back to the user. So to do that, we're going to go ahead and make a new public method, which returns a string. We're going to call this generate JWT. And we need to pass in this authentication object, which we're going to get from Spring Security. Let's go ahead and import our authentication. And this should come from Spring Security Core, not from Tomcat. So for the time being, I'm just going to return an empty string. That way it's not complaining at us and it's not airing out. And we're going to go ahead and start things now. So the first thing that we're going to want to do is we're going to want to go ahead and take a snapshot of the time. That way we know when we issue this token. To do that, we can go ahead and use an instant. So we're going to say instant now is equal to instant dot now. And this will go ahead and get the instant at the current time. Let's go ahead and import our instant. So what we want to go ahead and do now is we want to take all of our authorities and we're going to put them into one string. That way we can put them inside of our JWT. To do this, we're going to go ahead and make a new string variable called scope. Then we're going to get the roles out of our auth object that we passed into this method, map over them with the stream API, and then collect each string role using collectors.joining with a space. Now I need to go ahead and import a couple things. Firstly, we need granted authority from our Spring Security, and then we're also going to want collectors. So all this is doing is it's looping through all the authorities inside of auth. Auth is going to be an authentication object which has all of the roles from our user, and then it's going to map through them. And basically it's saying, hey, map it to a granted authority. If you went back to our model, you would see that our role goes ahead and implements granted authority, as you can see here. That's why we're allowed to do this. And it's just going to get the authority, which for us is either going to be user or admin. And it's going to combine all of those into a single string, delimited or spaced out by spaces. Next, we need to go ahead and set up something called the JWT claim set. And this is the information that the JWT is actually going to hold itself. So to do this, we're going to go ahead and say JWT claim set claims is equal to JWT claim set dot builder. And then we're going to pass in some more information from there. So inside the builder, we need to pass in a few things. First, we need to pass is issuer, which is just going to be self indicating that this specific backend or this specific service is issuing this token. Next, we need to go ahead and say when we issued this at. So we're going to use dot issued at and we're going to use this now instance that we created. Next, we need to go ahead and put in the subject. This is going to be the person who the JWT is going towards. And this is going to be auth.get name, which is going to have the username of the person logging in. Then we need the claim, which is basically going to be what information it's holding. And for us, this is going to be the roles that we want. And finally, we need to call build. Issued out was being a little bit finicky there after we saved it all turned up. So now we need to go ahead and use the JWT encoder and actually build a JWT token from this claim. So now instead of returning an empty string, what we're going to do is we're going to call JWT encoder dot encode. Then we're going to pass in a static method call to JWT encoder parameters dot from pass in those claims. And then we're going to get the token from that JWT encoder. So first let's go ahead and import our JWT token parameters. So again, let's walk through this. We're using the JWT encoder to encode a new JWT token. And to encode this JWT token, we're getting the information from our JWT encoder parameters from our claims list, which has self when it was issued, the subject name. And this could technically be any object. I believe this doesn't have to be a string, or I guess it does have to be a string. I'm wrong. So this could be the, the person's name. It could be something else if you want. But typically, I think it's using the user's username. We can have multiple claims. So you can put the scope. You can put some other things here. So what are they allowed to use and, and some other other information if you want you can put the entire user in there if you want uh, i wouldn't suggest that but you could and then we need to build it so this is our claims we're building a jwt token based on that then whenever we call get token value this is going to spit out the string value that we actually pass back to the user on the front end so now that we have this complete, what we could actually do is go ahead and create a response for a login because we don't just have to pass back the user. We're going to need to pass back a user and the string JWT. So what we'll do is we'll go up to our models package, hit new. We'll go ahead and make a login response DTO. And inside of our login response DTO, this is not going to be saved to the database or anything like that. We're just going to have a couple of things. So once again, we'd probably want a user DTO or something along those lines. Instead, we'll go ahead and just add in a private application user. And we're also going to go ahead and add in a private string JWT. 
So obviously the user is the person that was logged in in case they need the information and the JWT is going to be obviously the JWT. Now, theoretically, if we wanted to, we don't have to send back the user. Um, sometimes whenever I log in though, typically if you're doing something like React or something, you want to put the user into like a user slice or something along those lines because they logged in, they have the new information. If you weren't worried about that and all you want to do is send back a JWT, you can completely just ignore the step and not do it whatsoever. So now we need to go ahead and set up a couple of our constructors. We'll also go ahead and set up our getters and setters as well. And if you guys want to and know how to definitely go ahead and auto generate these. Now that our simple response DTO is set up, we can actually go about logging in the user. And to log in the user, we're going to go back into our authentication service and set up a login method. So back inside of our authentication service, at the top, we're going to need to go ahead and auto wire a couple more things. First thing we're going to need is a private authentication manager. And this is going to determine whether or not we want to go ahead and make a JWT token. And let's go ahead and import our authentication manager. And this is going to grab the instance that we set up inside of our configuration. And then we also need the token service. That way, after we know that we're authenticated to log in, we can actually go ahead and generate that token for the user. So let's go ahead and say auto wired private token service, token service. Now we can go ahead and save that. Now let's go ahead and start working on our login method. So to be able to log in the user, we're going to want to go ahead and create a public method, which returns the login response DTO and takes in the user's username and password. And let's go ahead and import our login response DTO. And for the time being, we'll return null so that it stops airing out. So the purpose of this method is it's going to take the authentication manager, it's going to look for a username and password and make sure that they are proper, it's going to generate something called a, an authentication token, send that over to our token service and generate the token and then spit it out. What we're going to want to do is we're going to want to start at the try catch because our authentication manager might throw an exception. So let's go ahead and do that. The exception that might be thrown is called an authentication exception. Let's go ahead and import our authentication exception. And this is going to come from org.spring framework. And it's probably going to complain for the time being, just because obviously this is no bueno. If this occurs, you'd probably want to rethrow some custom exceptions saying, hey, this doesn't work. Make sure it's a 401 or something along those lines. However, all we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and just return a new login response object with null and JWT token as empty. Let's go ahead and get rid of our old return null. It's going to complain for a second again, but it's fine. Now inside of the tribe, we want to go ahead and attempt authenticating with the authentication manager. So we're going to make a new authentication object, and that's going to be equal to authentication manager authenticate. And we want a new username password authentication token based off our username and password. Let's go ahead and make sure we import the correct authenticate. This is going to come from Spring Security Core. And let's go ahead and grab our username and password authentication token. So what this is basically going to do is whenever we send in a request for a login user, it's going to pass in the username and password to this authentication manager. And it's going to use our user detail service that we set up earlier. Grab the user. And if that username doesn't exist, it's going to throw an exception. Or if the username does exist and then the password exists, it'll create the token. Otherwise, it'll throw an exception. So basically, Long story short, all it's doing is it's going to use our authentication manager to use a user detail service to find the user, check their password. If everything's proper, it's going to spit out this new token for us to send called auth. And authentication is just a generic token or generic authentication object. So this new username password authentication token is a more specific version of authentication. Our token service method took in an auth and this is where it's coming from. So now we need to go ahead and get our token by making a new string called token and then call the token service dot generate jwt so if our user logs in successfully their username and password is correct the authentication manager finds the username and password it's going to generate a new jwt token and what we want to go ahead and do is return a new login response object with that user as well as the token so let's go ahead and return a new login response dto we actually want to send back the entire application user so we're going to, have to use our user repository.find user by username and then pass in the token that we generated as well 
There we go. Once again, if everything works properly, we'll generate our authentication token. We'll go ahead and send that token over to our JWT, and then we'll go ahead and return back the user as well as the token. Theoretically, what we could have done is we could have done the checking for the auth with the authentication manager, and then we could have just returned, passed in the whole user here and generated that stuff. But from the documentation, everything else I've seen, this is how they want you to do this. We can go ahead and save this. And now all we need to do is go ahead and set up the endpoint for our slash login, and we can go ahead and attempt to log in to see if we can get a JWT token. We need to go back into our controller then and then into our authentication controller. So once again, we're going to need another post mapping. This time it's going to go to slash login. And below a post mapping, we're going to make a new public method, which returns a login response object. We're just going to cheat a little bit. We're going to use a request body of type registration DTO. We'll probably need to go ahead and import our login response DTO. And typically what would happen here is you would have different DTOs for registration and login. Our object is so simple that they both just take in a username and password. A lot of time whenever you're registering a user, you'll probably take in the username, password, email, first name, last name, so on and so forth. And then you'll probably still have some hidden details such as like roles and other things like that that don't necessarily need to be sent across. And then typically your login DTO will most likely just be username and password. So our registration DTO is more like a login DTO, but it is what it is. This is going to be a very simple method. All we have to do is go ahead and return authentication service dot login user and then pass in that username and password from the body. And it's simple as that. We can go ahead and save and now we can go ahead and hop back into Postman. We'll have to re-register our user because we restart the server several times. But let's go ahead and register Ethan again and then let's go ahead and log in and see if we can get a JWT. So once again, we'll have to go ahead and register Ethan. So we have our auth slash register and we have our username and password in the JSON like we need. If we go ahead and send, we see we get a 200 back and we got all the information about Ethan. So now what we're gonna wanna do is go back into the top, hit the new icon and make a new post request to HTTP colon slash slash localhost colon 8000 slash auth slash login. Now inside of our slash auth slash login, we need a body of JSON. So we'll say raw JSON. And this also needs a username. So this is going to be Ethan and it needs a password, which will just be password. So now if we go ahead and try to log in, it should send back 200 with our newly created JWT token. As you see, we have our user back. Once again, you wouldn't want to send back all this information, maybe just a username and password or something. And we also have this JWT. So now if we try to access the slash user as normal, we should get a 401 unauthorized because we're not passing in our JWT token. As you see, 401 unauthorized. What we need to go ahead and do is instead of basic auth, we have to say bearer token. And then the bearer token is going to be this JWT that we generated. So go ahead and copy this guy and paste it into our bear token, which every time you add in the bear token, it just holds on to the last one. So I, that's why that's there for my footer series. If I send, we see a 200 okay user access level. Now, the only issue that we have here is that if we go ahead and do admin, we know that our user, Ethan, is only a user. But if we go ahead and use a git for admin, you'll see they also have admin level access. So the last thing that I want to go ahead and do for this quick tutorial is to show you guys how we can actually lock down different routes and different endpoints by actual rules. Unfortunately, this is not the easiest thing to do and it's kind of messy just because of the way that we have to store things into our JWT. But let's go ahead and hop back into our authentication configuration. I'll show you guys how to do this. So once again, inside of our security configuration, we need to go ahead and make one more bean and this is going to be a JWT authentication converter bean. Once again, we'll need the app bean annotation. And then below it, we'll need a method that returns a JWT authentication converter. Let's go ahead and import this JWT authentication converter. Because of what we named our roles in our table, we just called them role. We're going to have to convert all of the names inside of the claim roles into role underscore role. So for example, if it's a role user, instead of just having the role of user, we need to change this to role underscore user instead. Now to do this, we're going to need something called a JWT granted authorities converter. So to do that, we're going to go ahead and make a new object called a JWT granted authorities converter by calling new JWT granted authorities converter. 
Then we need to go ahead and set the name of the claim that this JWT granted authority converter is going to be looking for. In our case, we set the roles of our user in a claim name called roles. So we're going to go ahead and use JWT granted authority converter dot set authorities claim name equal to roles. Now we need to go ahead and tell the converter what we want to rename each role into. The Spring Security Convention is to use role underscore. This is why we obviously named our roles just like user or admin, because inside of our table, we don't want role underscore everything. So this is why we need to go ahead and convert these. So to convert these, we're going to go ahead and say JWT grants the authorities converter dot set authority prefix to role underscore. Now that we have told our JWT granted authorities converter what we wanted to look for and how to rename all of our rules, we need to go ahead and create a new JWT authentication converter to go ahead and call our JWT granted authorities converter. And this will go ahead and actually take those roles, append role name, and then return a new authority for us to use. So to do that, we're going to go ahead and create a new JWT authentication converter. Now we have our JWT authentication converter. Now we need to tell Spring Security what and how we are converting these JWT authorities. So to do that, we're going to go ahead and say JWT converter dot set JWT granted authorities converter with that converter that we set above. Now all we need to do is go ahead and return the JWT converter. So just to recap here, because it is a little bit confusing, currently, whenever we create a JWT token that gets decoded by the backend, it's going to have a claim called roles. The claim with roles is going to hold all of the roles that this user has. So basically, are they a user? Are they an admin? Are they an employee? Are they a guest? So on and so forth. The problem with this is that by default, what Spring is going to be looking for whenever it's decoding these and authenticating people is it's going to look for the role underscore. So currently, our roles do not have role underscore so then spring security will not know how to match a user against the roles so this jwt granted authorities converter is going to go through look at that token that it created and convert all of our roles inside of our role claim into role underscore and then this jwt converter will go ahead and spit out a new token that way spring security can be able to actually tell what's going on so to be able to actually use this we have to set this up inside the oauth2 resource server inside our filter chain we're also going to have to do a little bit of refactoring inside the filter chain anyway so let's go ahead and scroll up and take a look at that our csrf disabled is fine and our authorized http requests are going to need to be changed a little bit we still want our request matches to slash permit all however now instead of just authenticating everything we want to go ahead and list out some of our roles so first we want to go ahead and try to say auth dot request matchers and we want to try to match the slash admin route with any other route after that so any route matching slash admin slash, we want the user to have a role of admin. So what we can go ahead and say, it says has role and we want to make sure they have role of admin. So this part was really confusing to me whenever I was first trying to figure this out. The has role part is only going to look for uppercase admin. However, the authentication manager is going to look for role underscore admin. This is why we had to set up this JWT encoder before. Next, we want to go ahead and set up our user route. Let's go ahead and add an auth request matchers for slash user. So now for any route and get out of here, please for any route under the user tree, we want the user to either have a role of admin or user. So for this, we can say has any role. And then here we can say either admin or type user. So now admins or users can access this, but only admins can access the slash admin routes. After this, we want all other of our requests to be authenticated. Now to actually be able to set up our JWT to be read properly, we have to set up something in the OAuth2 resource server. Last time I attempted this, it was being a little bit finicky. So we're going to see if it wants to work. Otherwise, I'll do it the other way. So we're going to go ahead and get rid of this JWT from in here. And we're going to add dot JWT. And under that, we're going to add dot JWT authentication converter. And we're going to pass in that JWT authentication converter that we set up below. And now this is the issue as how before. For some reason, it doesn't like the session management. And even if I dot add dot and here, it still doesn't like the sessions management. So what we're going to go and do is we're going to separate these. So we're going to say instead of return here, we're going to say HTTP dot CSRF, blah, blah, blah. We're going to add a semicolon. Then we're going to add in HTTP once again. So HTTP and then dot OAuth2 resource server. And then we're going to add a semicolon. And then we're going to add HTTP dot 
session management. And then finally, we'll return HTTP.build. So I don't know why it's like this. Typically, you can add dot and I haven't figured out why it does this. We can save now and it should go ahead and work for us. I have an extra parenthesis. Or actually, I need a semicolon at the end and save. And now it should return the built HTTP. We can also go ahead and fix up this stuff to make it look a little bit prettier. But there we go. Now, if we head back into Postman and since we restarted the application, we'll once again need to go ahead and register Ethan. So let's go ahead and register Ethan and password. We can go ahead and log in Ethan with password. And now Ethan has a new token. We can go ahead and copy this new token. And if we go into slash user slash and put in Ethan's new token and send the request, we should see user level access. If we try to access admin with Ethan's token, it should say access denied or 401, 403 forbidden because we don't have authorization. A little bit different, but it's because we don't have the proper authorization. However, if we go ahead and add log in to admin, now we're going to see we have our admin. Our admin has a JWT token. Let's go ahead and copy and paste this. And then we can go ahead and paste in that admin token inside of here and send. And now you see admins have admin level access. Users have user level access. And this is basically how we can set up our very basic application. That's going to be it for this video. I want to thank you all for watching. You've gone to this point. This was an absolute behemoth of a video. And it also took me literally hours and hours and days of recording, of researching, of editing, and everything like that to get the video all complete. So if you made it to this point, please go ahead and hit that like button to show some support. And if you really enjoyed the content, go ahead and please subscribe. If if you do subscribe, then I'll go ahead and note that you guys do want more content like this. And if you have an ish for watching more coding content, I do have an entire series called Let's Build Twitter, if you haven't seen it yet, where I'm going through and building Twitter from the ground up using Spring Boot, Spring Data, React, and Redux. So I think you guys would really enjoy that. Once again, I appreciate all the support. This has been Ethan Uncoder. Have a great day, everybody, and peace out.